without objection uh, madam president uh, last week last saturday i held two town meetings in vermont on the collapse of the middle class uh, and both of them were very well attended and our guest speaker was elizabeth warren who is a professor of law at harvard law school and one of the leading writers in this country on economic matters uh, and in preparation uh, for that meeting, uh, I sent out an email uh, on my website just asking people in Vermont to tell me their personal experiences regarding what's happening <clears throat> to the middle class. And we have done that in the past, and, and frankly, I expected we'd get a couple of dozen responses. Uh, Madam President, what happened was really astounding to me and really speaks about what's going on in the economy in this country today. Over a period of a few days, we have now had some 500 responses, uh, most from Vermont, but also I do a national radio show, and we made a similar request nationally, <clears throat> and uh, we have had some from out of state, mostly from Vermont, some from out of state, but a total of some 500 responses. Uh, and what was absolutely astounding was the nature of these re responses. They were so powerful, so overwhelming, that in fact they were sometimes just difficult to read. A uh, person after person wrote with amazing honesty and with an articulateness which comes from telling the truth. They weren't given a great speech, as we often do here in the Senate, talking about everything under the sun. They were talking from their own hearts. They were talking about what it means to be trying to raise kids, try to send your kids to college, trying to pay your fuel bills, fill up your gas tank when you get to work. Amazing stories, and we are gonna post many of them uh, on our website. And what I wanted to do this morning, because I think it is terribly important that the Senate hears from ordinary people to get a sense of what is really going on in America, the struggles that people are having, that maybe it's a good idea we hear from the people rather than just campaign contributors, rather than just lobbyists. And the language that we heard from, that I heard from, uh, that came to my website was just extraordinary. So what I wanted to do this morning, and I have the feeling I will be doing it uh, more than once, is just listening to what people have to say and reading exactly exactly the words that they write to me. Let me begin, uh, Madam President, uh, by reading an email that came from a small town in northern Vermont. And I'm going to do my best to disguise the identities of the writers. But this is a, a small town near the Canadian border. And this is what this writer says. She says, quote, my family has been squeezed for years now. My husband and I have two children. My husband works full time and has a degree. He works 60 miles away from home and has tried to find a new job closer, but has been unable to do so. I tried for two years to find a job. When I could not find a job, I went back to school. I am hoping that my degree will help our family. The price of gas and oil now consumes 30 percent of our disposable income. We have cut back on groceries and recently were only able to get groceries because my parents were nice enough to give us money. We are going to buy a wood stove because we are afraid we will not be able to afford oil next year. We do not qualify for LIHEAP. My husband got a raise last year that disappeared on January 1st when the cost of our health insurance increased. We have to we have, to have reduced cost lunch for our children. We cannot afford to put our children on his health insurance plan and, we are, and luckily they are on Di Dr. Dinosaur, which is the Esther program in Vermont but now we have to pay a premium where we didn't last year. We have stopped doing any fun things. We have not been able to go out to eat in a long time or to bring our kids to see a movie. There are no treats. I am praying that after I graduate, I will be able to find a job to help my family out. Of course, when I go back to work, both my husband and I will have to start paying our student loans, and this payment will amount to about $500 per month. But what other option do we have? I couldn't find work. He can't find a better job closer to home. 
Both my husband and I have degrees. We did everything right. We are not doing better than our parents when they were our age. If it weren't for our parents, we would be worse off. Our parents have helped us with oil. My parents gave us $600 last year to pay for our oil. My husband's parents helped us with car repairs so we wouldn't go to, into debt. My parents have given us grocery money and bought our kids school clothes. I don't know what we would do without our parents. This is demoralizing. My husband keeps asking, when will we be able to actually afford to support our own family? I'm not sure what the answer is. Thank you for listening. A letter from a woman in northern Vermont. This is a letter from a woman in uh, central Vermont, north central Vermont, whose job, it turns out, was outsourced. This is what she writes. My husband and I are in our mid-50s. At this time of our lives, we should be at our peak earning power, putting money away for our retirement. Two years ago, we were. But now we are making about 42000 between us and struggling through this Vermont winter. I was an international IT manager, making a nice salary then. I spent 14 years getting my AS, BS, and then my master's degree from Champlain College, which is a college in Burlington, Vermont. We were comfortable and able to go on a nice vacation every couple of years. Then the company I worked for 18 years outsourced its entire IT operation to India. I received a layoff package, but at my age, it took me a while to find a job for one third of my previous salary. And that job is not even in my field. I am an accounting technician now. My husband was laid off from a job as an electrician's assistant, and he is now working in a hardware store. He makes $3 less per hour now. Both of our moms are near 80 and live with us. We also help to take care of our next door neighbor, who is 83. We are struggling to keep up with our bills. Fortunately, when we refinanced our home several years ago, we took a fixed rate mortgage. Even so, our heating, gas, and even grocery costs are rising so quickly, and our salaries are not. When I was younger, I found it easier to regroup from a loss like this. But then everyone wanted to hire me when I was younger. I thought the government was, quote, of the people, by the people, and for the people, end quote. But it seems to me that it is mostly, quote, of the people, by the lobbyists, and for the rich, end quote. By the time we get to retirement, maybe when we're 70 at this rate, Social Security and Medicare will be gone, and we'll be on our own. I feel as though our government has sold us out, and even if we elect a new president who cares for the people, it will take too long to recover for us to reach a comfortable place again. Thank you for listening, Senator Sanders. This is a very brief uh, e uh, email that we receive from a small town in, in, in central Vermont. Between my retirement and Social Security, I get a grand total of $804 a month. My last oil delivery was over $600 for the month of March. That's my story, and I'm stuck with it. Thank you, Senator, for trying to make it better. This is from the wife of a logger in northern Vermont. A lot of people in the state of Vermont earn their money in the woods. They go out and they cut trees. This is the toughest time I have seen since I was a child. My husband is a self-employed logger and has an excavation business. The way the economy is has really hit in both of his employment very hard. The price of logs have dropped drastically and no one is building. He has extremely high blood pressure, but somehow we cannot receive any help. We do, not, we do have catamount blue health insurance that we pay $250 a month for but that does not cover some of his medicine, nor does it cover all hospital bills. We have exhausted any savings we had, but still have a small IRA, but cannot touch that without being penalized. We have had to refinance, refinance our home of 34 years, and I have just started a job, but it requires me to travel 35 miles one way, and with the price of gas, it is almost a hopeless case. I'm sure there are other people in worse shape than us. 
but I have to wonder why the government is not helping the working person. The only thing I guess a working person has is pride. Is it worth it? I'm really beginning to wonder. And this is from a 57-year-old working widow, again from the central Vermont area. And this is what she says. I have no underlined, no disposable income, like many Vermonters. I drive a long way to my job and consider myself lucky to have one. And like most jobs in Vermont, it does not pay as well as the same job in other areas of the country. My round-trip mileage is 60 miles per day. I invested in an American-made hybrid in 2004, which gets between 25 to 30 miles per gallon. Also, the organization I work for does not reimburse me at the federal rate for the miles charged to them. I have to, I have, to have more and more money each week to pay for that week's gas and then wait to be reimbursed. It really is a tough squeeze, and some of my coworkers are in a tighter spot. I was fortunate to have locked in fuel oil last spring at $2.46 a gallon for 800 gallons. This is to supplement wood burning. However, I fell on the ice in December and hurt my shoulder, which makes lifting wood difficult. Therefore, I turned the thermostat back to 60 and lived that way. Now the thermostat is back to 50, and the burner only comes on to heat hot water. I stopped using hot water to wash my clothes over a year ago and just used cold water. I don't notice a difference. I have not had a vacation except a long weekend in years. At 57 and a widow and a woman, I can look forward to living in poverty. I am thankful for the things I have and pray that I can hold on to them. I have firsthand experience that there are many, many Vermonters that have much less and are falling through the cracks. They do not have enough food to eat and are, quote, too rich for fuel programs. I have a friend who is legally blind and lives on less than $800 per month. She lives in senior housing, so her rent is subsidized, but she still has to pay for utilities and food. How does she buy food and clothing on this pathetic amount of money? How can we be the richest nation in the world and allow this to happen? I vote. I give to charities when I can, albeit small amounts, but how can I move mountains? I pray for peace and justice because I don't know what else to do, and I am thankful for what I have and for what I am able to do. I appreciate your keeping important issues before the public. And let me conclude, as I said, these are stories from Vermont, but we have received similar type stories from all over America. And let me conclude with four stories for families in other states than Vermont. And this is from a young man in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Thank you so much for allowing me to tell the story of how our family is being squeezed by the current economic conditions in our country. Being from Oklahoma, I have two senators, um, et cetera. In December of 2000, I started work for my current company at the bottom rung of the ladder. I was changing careers yet again, and the old saying, you can't start at the top, certainly applied. I have worked my way up from a starting position part-time at $7.65 an hour through three promotions and into a management position in the mid-30s a year salary range. That used to be an okay salary here in Oklahoma. Not anymore. The rising cost of fuel, food, utilities, and other necessities has turned my okay salary into a near poverty level experience for my family. In addition to the above mentioned cost, I experienced a $102 per month increase in my portion of the premium for my employer provided family health coverage. I don't get it. I work hard every day. I show up on time every day, give it everything I have and never back off. And somehow, everything except my salary is going up at an alarming rate. My parents, parents taught me that no matter what, if we worked hard enough and never gave up, we'd get somewhere. It seems these days that doesn't hold true anymore. Please encourage your colleagues in DC to do something and hurry. I'm doing all I can, and it just isn't enough. This is from a young engineer in Gladstone, Oregon. I am a 26-year-old college graduate with a master's degree in mechanical engineering. I have been working for two years as an, engineering, engineer, as an engineer 
in the Portland, Oregon metropolitan area, and though I consider my compensation for my job to be appropriate for my level of education and expertise, about $60,000 a year, I am still struggling to make ends meet in this economy. Despite the fact that my home mortgage payment has remained stable, I am finding that the average price of energy and commodities has increased such that I can no longer afford to contribute to my 401k retirement plan, and I am living month to month with only about $200 in savings. I pay about $300 for gasoline, $200 for heat, $100 for electricity, and about $400 for food every month. This is fully twice as much as I was paying for the same expenses just two short years ago. Ouch. My situation is ironic and a bit frustrating. Whereas I now make over four times what I made as a graduate student, I live with the same quality of life as I did in college. I cannot afford vacations or extravagant purchases, and I am burdened, as so many people are these days, with a persistent worry about getting sick or injured and stuck with a medical bill that I cannot afford. I realize that I am nobody special in terms of how hard I work or how much I pay for food and gas or how quote unquote sad my story is. And that is why I write to you. I am moved by the stories of how these middle class families are surviving. And I can sympathize with them in terms of some of the financial worry they are experiencing. It is hard for me. It must be incredibly difficult for them. Thank you for your time and thank you for your service as a U.S. Senator and thank you for providing a forum like this. And this is from a 30-year-old man from, other, from the Pacific Northwest who feels the American dream has failed him. This is what he writes. I was raised, he writes, in extreme poverty. My mom had a ninth grade education and my father dropped out in sixth grade. My brother, three years my senior, dropped out of high school in 1996, the year I graduated. I never knew a house. We grew up in one and two bedroom apartments. I also never knew I was raised in poverty until adulthood when I tried to transcend the state of economic marginalization. I was the first of my family to graduate high school. Four years later, I entered junior college, transferred to a private four-year institution, and earned both an undergraduate and graduate degree. I also earned $70,000 in student loan debt. At that point, I never earned more than $7,000 in my life. Three years after college, I purchased my first home. You guessed it. My loan was predatory and was one of the ARMs. This was the first home ever purchased in, the, in, in our family. As you know, to truly gain a firm stance in the middle class, one must own property. I earned $50,000 in 1997, more money than I've ever known, yet I still have to charge my groceries or medications. My ARM matured and my mortgage raised $300 overnight. The first home in my family is likely to go back to the bank, and I'm fall, falling short of the finish line in the race out of poverty. I am now in credit card debt just to buy the essentials, and my student loan debt haunts me most of my life. I feel disillusioned by the American dream and the American middle class. If you graduate, if you go to college, if you then you will rise above the poverty line. Let me tell you, Mr. Sanders, I feel more impoverished today than I ever have. Why? Because when I was poor, I didn't ne have nearly $100,000 of debt, essentially making me indentured to my country. That isn't freedom. And finally, an uh, a email from a woman in, Alme in uh, California in a, a city near San Francisco. And this is the last letter. Both my husband and I have faced significant pay cuts the last year. We feel grateful to still have jobs, however. Many of our friends our age have no jobs and have been out of work for many months with no prospects in sight. We have three children and live in the high-cost San Francisco Bay Area where we were born. A combined income of 100 to 150,000 doesn't go very far at all here when a modest townhouse costs almost 600000 and everything else is proportionally more expensive. The difference in the cost of living across the country is never taken into account by politicians planning tax breaks and should be. Our oldest daughter completed two years in AmeriCorps after graduating from the University of Vermont, where she got a bachelor's degree in environmental science and conservation biology. Some of her student loans were forgiven by AmeriCorps, but not many. 
Now she works for an environmental consulting firm in Boston, but her wages are so low she can barely support herself, and we are paying, still paying $350 per month on her student loans that remain. We will owe $350 a month on those loans for the next 30 years. And she has close to $70,000 left to pay off. My husband is almost 61, and I am 52. We have nothing saved for retirement. One small IRA we have will be cashed out this year to pay for a new roof on our townhouse. We can barely meet our mortgage payments, property taxes, and pay our bills. We live month to month. Over the past year, we have cut out many of the extras we used to consider necessities. My husband felt extremely guilty running up a charge card to buy much-needed clothing for himself for work. He had not bought clothes for himself in about five years. Our home is now worth less than the loans we have on it. There is no money to replace our old rug or even have it professionally shampooed. No money to fix our broken clothes dryer. No money to repair our bathroom sink. No money to take even a modest vacation for a few days. The list goes on and on. We no longer have what we once considered a middle-class standard of living. Now we are nearly retirement years, realizing we will have to work, if we have jobs, until we die. How could we ever exist on Social Security alone in this area? It would be impossible since we will not have our home even close to being paid off. I have never felt so despondent about the state of our life and our family's prospects for the future. We have slid down the economic ladder one rung at a time. I used to believe if we worked hard enough, we would be rewarded for our work, but no longer believe that. We are working harder than ever and now make far less money. I see no improvement in our financial well-being in the future whatsoever. I am beyond anger. I have no more tears. I only have two questions that no one seems to be able to answer. And I think it's appropriate to end on this note. And this is what she says. I have only two questions that no one seems to be able to answer. Is everyone in Washington so far removed from the plight of our country's middle class that they cannot see what we are going through? Or do they see and simply not care. Mr. President, I yield the floor.